Okay. Well, good afternoon. This is Jim Soper with Ballots for Bernie. I am sitting with Jim March Simpson. How are you? I'm great. And you? Yep. Used to be Jim March. Now I'm Jim March Simpson. Which yeah. is <laughs> a good addition. Um, he took his wife's name. Yeah. Um, that was that was Interesting. good. Interesting. Yeah. I wish they had a, a uh, better term for maiden name. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. They don't, and I'm not going to use that term for you. Uh, <laughs> it don't work, does yeah. it? Yeah. I've known Jim for almost 11 years, mm -hmm. and he was working with Black Box Voting a long time ago. He is a geek's geek. Thank you. And has been active in election integrity for for 10 years, he took a bit of a pause, but got back into it mm -hmm. this year when he went traipsing off into the Middle West. Yes. <laughs> uh, and we're going to talk with him about what he saw there, what he learned there, and then mm -hmm. go back and do a little more history of, of some of what he thinks people should know about, about the election systems sure. and uh, what we can learn from him and mm -hmm. his experience and his depth of knowledge. Mm -hmm. So, Jim, you went off to Wisconsin, and what happened? Well, I was brought in by John Brakey and others uh, to help monitor the technical side of what was going on with the election processes. We wanted to know whether or not the election recount was being subverted in any way, or if the original count from election night had been subverted or could have been subverted. And my specialty is looking at the technical possibilities of how you attack a vote, whether a, an election was attacked. Uh, and we're not talking about voters misvoting at the polls. We're talking about what could a crooked election official do, crooked election staff, especially their tech staff, um, crooked poll workers, or worst of all, somebody who broke into the election process from the outside and raided it from as far away as pick one, Beijing, Moscow, London, etc. And so I was brought in to look at those issues and we found some all right. Uh, earlier this year, FBI Director James Comey assured the American people in Congress that America's, internet, uh, America's election systems were not tied to the internet. Yeah, that's not true, or at least in the case of some of them. Uh, one of the things we found is that one very popular series of voting machines, these are the optical scan voting machines where you vote on paper, but then it gets processed by a machine. Yeah, feed it, feed it into the box. It's called the ESNS DS200. The DS200 has two critical flaws. Uh, one, all across Wisconsin, ESNS sold it with cellular wireless modems, basically small cell phones implanted in the machine over the Verizon network, and they're supposed to call in the results on election night back to home base. Well, <laughs> there's two problems with that. The, if you have the right gear, and it wouldn't cost all that much, about 500 bucks worth of hardware, you could intercept that transmission out at the precinct. Over the air? Over the air. Raid it over the air. Uh, the, there's a famous device called a Stingray by the Harris Corporation. The Harris Stingray is a device that they sell to police agencies for big money. As far as we can tell, the price range is up, up into six figures. But it's a long-range cellular interception device. Well, somebody figured out that Verizon, for 250 bucks has a small cellular repeater station. You're supposed to plug it into your regular internet connection at home, and it will broadcast a Verizon cellular signal at about 40 feet range or so. So you can use your Verizon cell phone at home in the some remote area. Well, it's, it's that a booster it, type of... It's called a Fomato cell, but yeah, it's basically a booster. Okay. Well, it costs about 250 bucks. Well, you can hack one into an ultra-low budget Stingray device. Now, it won't have a lot of range, but if you know exactly where the precinct is, you don't need a lot of range. You can stick it in a backpack and be a voter or an observer, be standing around or stand around just outside, and you can raid that signal. Now, So that range is like 100, 200 feet? Mm, less, 40, less, 40, 40 50, okay. although you probably throw a booster antenna on it, get a little longer. Okay. But it's, it's, long, it's long enough to do some damage. 
But once I realized that what's going on at the other half, I almost lost interest in, in the possibilities of cellular hacking out at the places where the cellular modems are. Because in order to make the cellular modems work and contact home base, you have to leave an open channel on the internet from the home base central vote count computers to the general internet that these precinct machines dial into. Now, they put some what sounds like decent over the security. Uh, I want to repeat this yeah, over oh, yeah. the internet. It all happens over the internet. It's not a internet. private network. It's oh, yes. Here's the problem. Probable internet, yeah. They did appear to put some kind of security on there. We know that there's what's called a VPN connection, virtual private networking. But we also know that government-level entities the size of the NSA, the Russian intelligence, Beijing, those guys can crack VPN networks, period. They, they can do it. They have to throw big computational resources at it, but once they pre-crack certain large numbers, um, pre-plan an attack, if you will, they can raid most of the VPN systems in use commercially across the whole planet. And there's, there's definite indications that the NSA has done that, and it would be impossible to imagine that the Russians, the Chinese, the British, the Germans, Lord only knows who else is trying to keep up. When you say the NSA has done that, done what? They have uh, gone after the cryptographic guts of the VPN connection. So they have set themselves up to, in a position to be able to raid virtual private network connections. It takes big resources to do it properly. In, in some cases, now in a few cases, a VPN will be set up incorrectly and Joe Hacker in his mom's basement with an ordinary, fairly fast PC can maybe raid it, okay? But I, I'm not ready to say that that's the top threat. But if they're running virtual private networks as their security method on the general internet, they can probably keep out most of the Joe Hackers, but a government-level entity is going to walk through it like a ghost. Let's clarify for our viewers yeah. virtual private network a virtual a private simple real simple it's a way of having one computer that's on the internet be connected to another computer that's on the internet and nobody else can raid the connection it's heavily but you're piggybacking off of the internet and creating oh, yes. your own internal network with its own transmission protocols its own security i mean anybody can see that there's data passing through but nobody else can get to it because there's big hairy passwords on it. Okay. Okay. And encryption and right. that kind of stuff. Corporations that have employees work from home or from some remote location and want them able to access the company's own crown jewels, their, their big databases, etc., of valuable patient information at a hospital, for example, would give a home worker a VPN connection back to home base. And if that's set up correctly, it'll keep out Joe Hacker. It won't keep out the NSA. It won't keep out the GRU. It won't keep out whatever weird hacking subgroups Beijing's got going on. It, no, ain't gonna happen. Okay, so you have these precinct scanning machines, the right. S200s, uh -huh. that have a wireless modem so yeah. that they can call home. Yeah, and every precinct, over. yeah, and every precinct that had the DS200, every county in Wisconsin that had the DS two hundred. Every was, county. No, no, everyone that had that it, had which it, is yeah. about, which worked out to be a little more than half of Wisconsin's vote, because mm -hmm. several big counties like Milwaukee and Brown used it. All the counties that used it used the wireless connectivity features. You can turn them off. You can even take those wireless modems out and use them standalone, then hand carry the electronic ballot boxes back to home base. That's what you should do if you've got a DS-100. Any election officials, listen to me. If you've got a DS-200, <laughs> pull out the wireless modem. I will Make note it. that in California, wireless is by state law That's right. forbidden. Forbidden. Period. So and you can't use it. So right. is the DS-200. According to the certification documents at the California Secretary of State's office, it is not a certified voting technology. Now, I mentioned two flaws with this thing. There is another one that's almost as troubling. Um, the DS200 is one of these new generation of optical scan machines that we actually like that takes a picture of the ballot. Not just, for example, say this was a teeny tiny ballot. It's a business card. 
say it's a teeny tiny ballot. Before, a, a, you'd have a fill in the dot bubble here and there on the paper. And the machine would just pick up the bubble position, whether it's on or off. It wouldn't take a picture of the ballot. That's the old Mark Sense ballot scanners. Well, those are going the way of the dodo bird because the rest of the data processing industry no longer uses those. So the voting machine makers cannot get the guts for one of those old primitive scanners. So they've had to go to the newer kind of scanner that goes, picks a picture of the entire ballot at once and holds it internally and then processes that to figure out the voter intent, figure out whether you voted for Hillary or Trump or you got disgusted and went home with the whole idea. Um, yeah, which is not impossible this year, unfortunately. So those graphic scans, in theory, are an awesome audit tool. We can get a hold of those on a USB memory stick. We can run our own tabulation. We can check, double check, I should say, what's going on at, uh, at the county's computers. Uh, we want people like myself, John Brakey, and others involved in this movement want to have a day where on election night, once every ballot's been scanned, the Democratic Party chair, the Republican Party chair, if there's a Green, Libertarian, Civics groups, whatever, gets a memory stick, here you go, here's your set of ballots, and we all run them on our own software, on our own laptops, and we find out real quick um, what the vote really was, see if there's any discrepancies between the Democratic tally and the Republican tally. That's the future which we want to move to. Well, ESNS put a fly in that ointment because although it's a graphic scanning scanner, the election officials have a choice between turning on or off the ability to save the graphic scans to a disk. Memory stick, hard disk, doesn't matter. If they turn that feature off, it's not that they are refusing to create a public record, it's that they're destroying public records. Because in order for these machines to work at all, they have to make that picture and hold it in the computer's memory and work with it to extract voter intent. Now the choice is, do you save that public record or do you destroy it? And that destruction option is what ESNS gave election officials. Now, in weird stark contrast, I'm fairly well known as being a big critic of Diebold's election systems, which used to be global. Well, Diebold got sold to something called Premier. Premier got sold to something called Dominion. So the, the Descended company of Diebold is Dominion Voting Machines in Canada. Well, I find it weird to say this, but Dominion is actually making the best voting machines in America right now because their equivalent to the DS200 is very similar. It's a graphic scanner, but it has no wireless transmission of results, although I have heard a rumor that they're considering building an optional version. If they do, I'll kick their butts again. But right now, they don't have wireless transmission. And when they take the picture of the ballot, they save it to disk, and the election officials have no choice about the matter. So that's two big advantages over ESNS. We it's still the, have a problem of getting access to those oh, digital images. Oh, you betcha. Listen, before I went to Wisconsin, was working in Wisconsin this year was not my first thing I did in election integrity this year. The first thing I did was a series of public records requests in other states. I didn't even touch Wisconsin. Okay, Wisconsin wasn't on the radar when I started. I looked at states where, that were likely to be trouble spots. So I did public records requests in California, Colorado, Iowa, Nevada, um, Pennsylvania, and Ohio. Okay, just to see what kind of responses we were going to get and how much cooperation we were going to get. The absolute best case response has come from the city of Denver, Colorado. Denver, you freaking rock. You guys are cool, because not only did they make the graphic images available as quickly as they claimed they legally could under Colorado law, okay, and that's a problem, but that's not their problem. They put them on the internet and just gave me a link to go download wow. instead wow. of tr making me mail them a hard disk and get it back in the mail and any of that. They did an FTP transfer of all the ballot images. So... Denver's intent was the best of anybody, although Colorado law still blocks them from distributing those graphic images until after any possible challenge period is over. Oh. Yes, okay? Now, that's not Denver's problem. It really is state law. I checked. It's, it's not them, okay? So every jurisdiction in Colorado says, yeah, well, you can have, well, excuse me, there were some Colorado jurisdictions that said no. There were other Colorado jurisdictions, this is a good one, 
Colorado law says that if they're going to distribute these ballot images, these little pictures on memory sticks or hard disks or whatever, or FTP site, however they do it, they have to edit out any stray marks so that voters can't sell their votes. It's the theory that a voter might make some little squiggle in the corner and then go to Guido the Loan Shark next week and say, hey, I voted correctly, right? So pay me my 20 bucks or whatever. <laughs> Idiocy. But that hand redaction process, uh, Denver's decided to just do it for every election and not charge anybody. Other Colorado counties, oh no, we want a thousand bucks for a much smaller pile for us to go through and hand edit out the stray marks, which of course allows them to edit the graphic files and the whole thing's useless and not anyway. De uh, Colorado is not the worst players though. The state of Iowa, by law, blocked those ballot images from public records release at all, ever, no way, no how. Iowa's the worst case scenario. Uh, there's been a couple of attempts to, by somebody else to get them in Washington state, and the Washington court systems have blocked them from public records access. City of Los Angeles plane blew me off. Wonderful. Um, Clark County, Nevada had the absolute worst response to my records request. Uh, we don't give public records responses to any election materials at all, ever. It's all blocked. And when I looked at the actual law, he's lying. There was no barrier to public records access to election materials. But he tried to bluff me and say, uh, no, you can't have anything. We need to talk about Clark County because I've got other reports saying it's an absolute snake pit. Back to, back to my thing, though. Okay. Ohio, let me give you one more horror story about responses to these records requests, and I'll shut up about it. Cuyahoga County, Ohio. We told them we want these ballot images, and, we, and, you, and they had the ES&S machines where you can turn on or off the saving. So before Election Day, we said, hey, please turn the save function on. Said, oh no, we're turning it off. We're throwing away all of your public records requested materials. I may have the resources to go after them in, in court on that under public record law. That there's a, a, an Ohio lawyer that wants to bite off a big piece of their butt already. He's mad at him, and so I think they're going to get theirs. But these are the variety of responses we're going to get, and it was necessary to file these requests, find out what the responses are. And then hopefully over the next four years, we'll have the resources to start breaking these barriers down in court so that we can protect the 2020 election cycle. Can I protect the 2016 election cycle this way? No. It's done. Almost done, but yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, there's lots of interesting things <laughs> there. Uh, I think the Voting Rights Task Force here in California is going to try to get a bill introduced in 2017 to put the ballot images um, on the table mm -hmm. for viewing by mm -hmm. by the public. We will see what, how that evolves. Mm -hmm. When you went into Wisconsin, yep. did you see smoke indications of certain places that were smelly? The biggest thing I saw was that Wisconsin law is very good regarding those ballot images. They make them public record, and the law says that they have to turn on the, the scan save function on the ESNS machines if they have that choice. So that, that's good news in Wisconsin. But while they saved the graphic images for the main election in several big key counties, Brown County and Milwaukee County, two of the most important counties in the state, that's Green Bay and, of course, Milwaukee, they turned that, the graphic scanning on for the main event, but in the recount, they turned it off. They did not want anybody comparing. When the, they were rescanning the same yeah, ballots? They, re they did a machine recount in both cases instead of a hand recount. Yeah, which but is they already... Wanted to, that's shady enough. But then they wanted to make sure that nobody could compare the stack of ballot images from the main event and the recount. Why? Good question. I don't know the answer to that. Do I have my suspicions? Yeah. Do you care to elucidate those suspicions right now, or do we? Well, one re there's there's only a couple of reasons you you do it that way. Uh, if they were manipulating the paper ballots between the first and second to make some kind of funny result work, that would require some kind of scam where there's mass substitution of paper ballots. Um, either before, either on election day before, or the day after, or something like that. Uh, 
Is that what happened? I don't know. But their behavior is just strange in this area. Do you know if these images, when they're being scanned mm -hmm. in, they're given each a number? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. They're given a file name. Uh, for example, uh, 1493, uh, this is for a particular paper ballot. I've got one set of this from Florida. So a particular ballot would have two files associated with it. 1493i is the image file. And 1493C is the count, um, the derived voter intent file. It's just a little bit of text. The, the voter for that particular ballot number voted for Hillary, voted for this guy for governor, voted for this guy for senator, and so on and so forth. In plain text. Is the number then printed on the ballot too? So that no, we had to dig that, the... Well, that's, it can be, but Wisconsin turned off the feature where they can print it to the ballot. And that feature only exists on the big ESNS machine, the 850, the big brother to the 200. The central scanner. Yeah, it's a big high-speed monster. It feeds them in so fast, it looks like a machine gun. So the answer, generally speaking, is no. You Once the once that ballot's back in the stack, all you have is one, one data file showing the picture of the ballot, or each side, yeah. whatever it is and another file that tells you what voter intent was derived from that paper ballot. But we can't go back and stack of ballots and find that ballot that, of which we have an image, no. about which we might have some questions, no. we can't. But if we, it would have been really nice to be able to do a quick electronic compare of the stack from the recount versus the stack from the earlier main event. Yeah. And man, they made sure we couldn't do that. I wonder why. Can you think of any administrative reasons? I mean, I think we all recognize that these election officials are in general overworked and some of them just don't want to or can't do more work. And sometimes that's the reason, but sometimes that's not the reason. Do you have any yes. Look, that's always one of the big questions is, are we looking at incompetence or are we looking at corruption? It can be very, very difficult to tell the difference, and that's been a, a big stumbling block this whole time. The, the entire time I've been dealing with election issues, going back to 2003. But what we've seen, what we saw again in, in spades, and the recounts here is stonewalling. And Absolutely. Absolutely. We saw that back in 2000, where they, the problem wasn't the hanging chance, it was that we ran out of time to count the ballots, or recount oh. the ballots. And it's again happened in, in all of these recount states where they were stonewalling and that just, shall we say, is very disappointing, mm -hmm. at the least. Well, let me, let me tell you what a worst case scenario looks okay. like. There's a term that, uh, it's an informal term that a few of us use, myself, John Breaking and others, called the Clay County Shuffle. A Clay County Shuffle is a particular type of attack against the election. It's named after events in Clay County, Kentucky, a few years back, where eight members of the election department went to prison, convicted of felonies. And we know what they did. They took their available pool, small pool, out of the total number of poll workers who they knew were corrupt, and they stacked them in key places. They put them together in key precincts that they wanted subverted. They put them together in key audit boards that they wanted subverted. And when you walk into a precinct, you're seeing, allegedly, uh, up to half a dozen or more of ordinary citizens sitting around and doing the election that day, and you'd think, oh yeah, I mean, if one's corrupt, two are corrupt, you know, the others will catch it. But the Clay County Shuffle subverts that whole concept by piling together in key precincts, all corrupt, all the time, and everything goes bad in there. Um, I know that Clay County shuffles have happened in Pima County, Arizona, under the current election administrator. And by the way, yes, he could sue me uh, for libel for that. We'll let him try. Okay? I am confident in what my... I haven't been able... Well, John Brakey and I have not been able to throw this guy out of office. This guy at one point falsely arrested John Brakey for observing an election. Uh, and uh, those charges were thrown out and the election administrator had to apologize. I, we know this guy's dirty. We just don't, okay? We've seen too much. Um, is it happening elsewhere? Well, the reports I'm getting out of um, Clark County, Nevada, strongly suggest that, among other things, you got a Clay County shuffle. 
strongly suggest. What makes you say that? I mean, you, you okay. indicated to me Nevada yeah. was that issue. So the first, so the first indi that? indication I got there was a problem in Clark County, Nevada, when he was the least transparent for public records responses that I've ever seen of any election agency. You can have absolutely nothing related to my election, period, goodbye, click. Now, when I heard that, this was an email, so there was no actual click of a phone, okay? It was all email transmissions. When I saw that, I said, man, this dude's hiding something. We, all, we now have local activists on the ground who are getting much worse reports. There's a local radio personality who has uh, a recording of a person from the post office who is saying that the mail-in vote and also mailed out um, candidate info and, and candidate advertising material has been subverted. One guy was running for a state legislative race where there were 17,000 votes at stake. He sent out 10,000 campaign flyers. 9,300 of them came back for uh, you know, invalid address or something, something else was wrong with the mail, and they all come flooding back to him. 90% uh, yeah. yeah, that doesn't that doesn't ever happen. That's insane. Okay, and the guy's running off a good current mailing list another good example uh, we've got a report of Ballots being mailed out to two apartment buildings that are long shut down and condemned Yet they were not come. I know I know and, and they were sent to those buildings or they were sent those? to those buildings and then when they came back they went into special bins marked election instead of the normal, you know, bad mail process. Bins at, where at the it, post office. At the post office. The, the, part of the allegations coming out of Clark County is that there are people who sub help subvert the election inside the United States post office. Now, if that is true, and we need to find out, but if that's true, we need to bring the federal government involved because Absolutely. the feds will go bananas. If they find out the, US, sure. the local U.S. post office got subverted, but it can happen, you know. Uh, we're talking about Las Vegas. That's the town that was founded by the mafia. <laughs> you know, if you, if you know the, orig the the original Las Vegas wasn't in Vegas. It was in Hot Springs, Arkansas, and they got thrown out just after World War II, and the whole thing picked up and moved to Vegas, where they can control everything. Yeah, I mean this. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way. The people that are running that, if that, if what's going on in Clark County, if the reports I'm getting are accurate, it's not a Republican problem. It's a Democrat problem. Meaning it's that the a, Democrats are, are manipulating yeah, things? That's okay. what it looks like. That is the appearance. That's a possibility. I it could happen. Just, mm -hmm. I, I'm going to bring up my own little point that, that piggybacks off of this of sending ballots yeah. to empty apartment buildings. Yeah. Uh, Beth Harris hinted 10 years ago about the idea that some shady characters were getting the vote by mail business. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and, good Lord, yes. And then I came up this summer with a term called automated forgery, taking the idea that one, counties are forming out the mailing of vote by mail ballots oh, to absolutely. tiny absolutely. shops or just just these these small companies, mm -hmm. and they get access to blank ballots, blank envelopes, address, name, and oh, it's signature. Much, it's much worse than that. It's much worse than that. One of the companies that does this sort of thing, and they tend to be regional. You don't have one really big national company doing this, but you got a lot of small ones, yeah. election services groups. Well, one is called Runback Election Services in Arizona. Let me tell you about Runbeck. You've heard of early voting. It's where you walk into election offices, they say a week before election day, say, I want to vote today. Okay, the traditional thing they would do is that they need to figure out where you live and what precinct you are, and then they get to give you your particular ballot. So they pull your particular ballot out of a whole bunch of bins for the ballot styles. So, for example, if you live in one part of the county, in one town, you might be voting for this guy for mayor. If you're out on county land, you may not be voting for anybody from there, but you've still got county board of supervisors. This is typical, okay? Well, Runback said, hey, how about instead of pre-printing all these ballots in these little bins, we'll set up a PC and a printer, and you can generate them on demand. 
So a clerk there at the county election office says, punches into a computer and says, okay, you need ballot style, one, two, three, four, five. Ta -ta -ta. And a printer sits there and prints your paper ballot, now you vote on it. This is what Los Angeles County is going to be hey, doing. Going. Yeah. yeah, here's the problem with that. Runbeck did not bother to even so much as put a little sticker on the make and model of Okie Data laser printer they were using. Okay? Go on Amazon, you can buy exactly the same printer for about four or five grand. Okay? It's a high-end color laser printer, but it's still a desktop device. You can fit two of them on somebody's kitchen table, no problem. They're not that big and they're not that bulky. So the security of the thing is based on the fact that you've got a PC connected to that printer, and the PC, when it prints the ballot, it counts how many it printed. There's some security there, but you just unplug the little port take another laptop, walk up to it with a ballot image, which the county election officials have access to, and you can crank out as many blank ballots as you want. Nothing's stopping you on that printer or on one that you bought on Amazon and have hidden in your chief election text basement. And so the cost of creating new fake paper ballots has crashed. It used to be that you needed a big offset printer to make new fake paper ballots. Not anymore. Runbeck, in their infinite stupidity, ran around and marketed this to all kinds of different election officials, and every time they did, they taught them how to set up an illicit ballot printing station. By that make and model of Okie Data laser printer, or equivalent. So you can get <laughs> the blank ballot. It's, it's potentially possible to have the... Mass substitute. Mass substitution. Mass substitution. Of paper. Now... Go, now let's go to Wisconsin. They didn't want me comparing the ballots from election night versus the recount with about, what, three weeks the images. apart. Yeah. yeah, they didn't want me comparing the images. I wonder why not. Oops. There is, I, I will repeat, uh, it's a comment made by various people that we all respect, is there's no smoking gun proof until you get to the ballots. Yeah. And, and count the ballots Absolutely. for the amateurs. Well, but they're preventing us from coming up with that proof by not absolutely. letting us look at the images. Absolutely. This is, this is stonewalling. It's stonewalling absolutely. of democracy. And we need to we need to deal with this and, and make it better, make people aware of what's going on, and, and we need to deal with this. We have to take strategic lawsuits to the United States Supreme Court. We need a right to fast public oversight of the election process. We need a right to secure voting machines, and if they're not secure, then our rights are being violated. We're not gonna get this until we go to the United States Supreme Court. I was a member of one group of organizations in another political fight altogether that has, over the, since 2008, has taken, well, they started in 1999. It took them from 1999 to 2008 to get to the Supreme Court once, in 2010, they got to the Supreme Court again, and they established basic civil rights for their movement. But that's because support for them doesn't come in impulses every four years. It's continuous. Okay? Here in the election biz, I've been watching this since 2003, 2004. Oh, it's time to protect elections. Big flood of money comes in. That supported black box voting for a couple of years. It was a pretty big burst. But it was gone, you know, after a bit. You know, it was at it by the end of 2005, something like that, most of it. Uh, 2006, so a little bit of money. 2008, oh, now it's time to spend big on the election. Well, it takes three years to protect the election, minimum. And rich funders would call me in, say, June of this year, 2016. It's a general election cycle, right? Hey, Jim, it's time to get on the ball. And I, my response is, where were you two years ago when we could have made a difference? This is a long-term, oh, yeah. continuous oh, yeah. fight. You bet. Uh, well, and I'll tell you something else. Back in 2003, 2004, when Bev Harris and I were two of the, the top people involved in this brawl, just before I talked to you, actually, uh, Bev and I had a conversation that I will not forget. Back then, it all looked like Republican fraud, the, all the stuff that we could see so far including Republican ties to the voting machine vendors, to the voting system certification bodies, all it looked Republican. And we said, and I said to Bev, Bev, you know, if we don't get this under control, we're gonna see Democrats start to do the same thing. 
And I am telling you in 2016, that future has arrived. It's, there's problems on both sides now. I'm just telling you flat out. Um, there's problems on both sides. Bev, yep. I've been saying that a long time. You're talking about Nevada, which may be... Yeah, I think Nevada, Nevada may be a special case. I'm just going to tell you, Nevada looks worse than anything I've even heard of in recent times, other than a place like Clay County, Kentucky. But out of a big jurisdiction, holy mackerel, they look bad. And it's a swing state. And it's a swing state. Oh, Lord. We're getting up towards 4 o'clock. How are you for time? Mm, I can go another 10, 15. Okay. Um, the, we've talked somewhat about the contractors. Mm -hmm. And a, a question that I've had, and this is sort of a geeky thing, but I'm hearing something about some touchscreen machines, the DRAs that keep valid images, but they're not images. Do you know what I'm talking yeah. about? Yeah. Well, that's now, what is that? No. Okay. Um, I told you that Diebold's ImageCast series was pretty good, and for now, I said Diebold. No, they're now Dominion. Okay, but there's some of the same players still involved. And for me to praise anything from them, I, it, it should shock anybody who really knows me. Look, at one point, Bev Harris and I sued the state of Cal sorry sued Debol to get the state of California a refund of 2.6 million dollars. We each collected a small bounty on that, like 76 thousand dollars. I put I bought a small motorcycle, my part of it, and I stuck the word libel right on the gas tank and parked it outside of the Secretary of State's office. Yes. You remember that? Yeah, Lib remember libel that. bike. So, for me here. to praise something coming out of Dominion today is amazing, but what Dominion has is the same station that's also a graphic scanner of, that eats paper ballots will, allows somebody who's disabled to, to vote on a touch screen, but then it prints a paper ballot that's no different from anybody else's, except maybe the bubbles are a little bit cleaner looking. But other than that, it's the same as everybody else's. And then it feeds into the same graphic scanner, goes into the same ballot box, and gets added to all the same stacks as anybody else's ballots. If we're going to do a touch screen for the disabled, that's how to do it. Okay? Mm -hmm. And certain promises have been made to the disabled community and by various election officials, by various um, certification bodies, and if you're not going to go back on those promises, if you're going to support, you know, the ability for people who are pretty severely disabled to vote securely and in private, then that's a way forward. Okay. But then again, they, these are images as we would expect them to be images. Oh, yeah. They'll be in the same um, pile. I, I, electronically I, and paper, speaking both electronic and paper terms, they'll be in the same pile. There's an issue in Travis County, Texas, over mm -hmm. what is a ballot image or not, and we won't oh. continue on that unless you know well, about that. that. I, I don't, but I, I know what the arguments are going to be. I mean, I'm fighting the same arguments in Iowa, in Colorado, in, yeah, we know. That's okay. something we got to sort out over the next four years, minimum, sooner if possible. Do you have any comments, because there are accusations coming from the American government, the American Intelligence Committee, mm -hmm. commission, uh, community, mm -hmm. and also expressions of fears from the German and French government about Russian hacking Russian hack. into specifically the DNC. Yeah. Generally, the United States and both the French and German governments are saying they're worried about it because they have elections coming up yeah. next year. Do you have any comment about that? Well, yeah, I have two. Um, there's three things they could be doing. First of all, if they're raiding the DNC or various political parties and just publishing dirt that they find, I'm going to say something radical. I kind of like You never that. did. No, I kind of like that. And I'll tell you why. I don't care if it's the Russians doing it. I don't care if it's some idiot in mom's basement. I kind of like that because the only way that the DNC and other political groups can, can block that is by not acting in a corrupt fashion. Just John breaking calls in. Yeah. Uh, uh, he can't help himself. No, we're still live. Are we? We're still live. <laughs> Sorry, folks. The call came in on my phone, and we're still live. Lovely. Uh, just hold it. Just hold it. We're going to be done. Just, 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 just
What are you doing? <laughs> Don't film you. No, 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 no. Dude, Look the other way. You're pointing it at you. Okay, Look well. Look at the it this way. Thank you. Okay, just, just <laughs> kind of put your hands down in the box and hold it for 10 minutes. Put your finger on the left. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, well, I guess that works. In lower resolution, we have to see our... No, we have one more. Oh, hold on. You're on. Yes, we are now. Okay, so let me... Sorry, folks. Uh, I'm going to continue my thought. Yeah. If it's not the Russians doing PR stuff... Oh, okay. Did they directly subvert yeah. votes? Did they go in and change anything in either That's the voter registration question. system or the actual election system? Yeah. That's maybe a more important question. Okay. I don't know. Could they have? Yeah. The voter registration systems in particular are very vulnerable to outside manipulation. You've got, by law, a state central database of who's allowed to vote or not. Every state has got a central registry. And that has to be replicated out to each county so that they can figure out who their available pool of legal voters is. So, uh, can that system be subverted and broken into? In theory, yeah. Up until my visit to Wisconsin, I would have told you that most of the voting machines themselves, the machines that actually tabulate the vote, which is separate from who can vote, always remember that, big distinction, I would have told you that the vote tabulation systems and vote scanning systems and even the touch screens probably not going to get outside rated. After looking at how the DS200 works, after looking at the tech specs on the parts inside, it can be rated. The DS200 in particular, if that machine is in your county, in your state, well, in your country, really, you ought to be worried. And it's a very common voting machine across America. Can that thing be rated? Yeah. If they're doing wireless transmission. If they rip the wireless parts out of each of those machines, they're not doing wireless transmission or phone line hacking. There's really no different. You could attack that, too. If they're not doing that, okay, fine. If they've got remote transmission of votes, then uh, I wouldn't not good. even say okay, fine, because yeah, it, it's well the hard thing, to to to. to yeah. I mean, Hardy Hursty showed that she can break oh, into yeah. a DRE. I think one of the more yeah, but you need on-site with the with the Hursty attack. You need on-site access. Yes. Okay. Inside. Okay. Um, the plus we got a little problem with it. Camera. Oh, the camera moved. Just... There we okay, go. Okay, we're back in. We're back. Um, okay. We won't stay on much longer. No. The Hursty attack needs direct access. If the machines are kept over, the then, over you know, where, where the county hands out the machines to poll workers on mm -hmm. Friday and they drive them home mm -hmm. and keep them in the garage over the weekend, then people they can easily yes. get access. They can get access. Do they have the skills? Well, it depends. Everybody who used to work for a county, they used a particular, unless, for, let's say, for example, a county uses the, the Dominion image cast series of voting machines. If they have a, one of their tech staff quit, and before the guy quits, he learns how to hack an image cast, then yes, he's a threat. Absolutely. If somebody gives him the, the little mm -hmm. card to put in and, and, and flip yeah. it, he doesn't have to know how to hack it himself. That's somebody who su supplies well, the material to do it. somebody with, who, if somebody joins the county election department who has my level of skill or higher, a Hursty level of skill, oh my God, you know, I can do anything once. Really uh, good, if, yeah. he, oh, Hursty's good. There's there's others, uh, Bruce Schneider, there, there's other top it's, great yeah. hackers that are way beyond my class, including Hardy. Yeah. Um, if somebody like that gets hired by an elections agency, and gets late night access to the machines and learns how to totally subvert him and quits the next day, yeah, he's a real threat. Could that happen? Oh, yeah, it can happen. Okay, we'll finish up with one more question. Absolutely. What can people do to help secure elections over the next four, six, eight years? I almost want to quote Warren Zevon saying we need lawyers, guns, and money. <laughs> We're okay. not at the guns part yet. <laughs> With lawyers and money, I would say yes. Oh, what would you use lawyers for? 
Um, we the money needs to pay for the lawyers, but uh, the money is paid for the lawyers. We need strategic lawsuits on public records access and oversight access into the election process. California, for example, has a law where uh, political parties and civic groups are supposed to be able to schedule a tech inspection of the actual voting machine before election day to probe for, for problems. Um, it needs to be strengthened, and then it needs to be replicated across the country. Mm -hmm. Okay, That's an example of the kind of change. And if we establish a basic civil right to uh, observe the counting of our vote, to have effective oversight of our vote, if the courts find that such a basic civil right exists, which they should, then we can force changes in law, even in states that are quite thoroughly subverted, places like Nevada. If the Ninth Circuit, for example, rules that we have a basic civil right to observe the counting of our vote, that immediately affects a place like Nevada that's currently one of the least transparent agencies on the planet. Well, you're right that uh, part of this is litigation. Ray yes. Lutz in San Diego won a partial mm -hmm. point just on the observing. It applies right now to San Diego, but he says when you run a 1% audit, you have to subject all vote by mail ballots to that audit, and San Diego wasn't doing that. There's a whole bunch of things. People, a lot of people went in to watch the the, the ballot counts or the audits uh -huh. in June, and they needed binoculars to look at what was going on. And that's just that's not observing votes. I'll let you finish with one story. I know. That you yourself collected a, an arrest yes. in San Diego. Do you yes. want to just tell that? Uh, and then we'll the, the, the real short form is I knew I was observing the election in July of 2005. So it wasn't a major election, but it was an opportunity to establish a right to observe the elections. It's the kind of thing we do in off years. Um, so I'm down there, and I cannot see what's going on in the central tabernacle. It's behind glass in a sealed room, 10 feet behind the glass, a little tiny print, plus the guy's head is sitting in front of the, the screen. You, know, you can see the back of his head, you can't even see the screen. So I says, okay guys, look, let me go down to Fry's Electronics, buy a video splitter, we'll set up a second monitor, and we'll, we'll be able to see what's going on yeah. on a closer monitor. I said, and this was, this was like six, seven hours before election day. And they said, no, I ain't going to do that. Okay, well, how about you just move the tables closer to the screen, closer to that window? No, I ain't going to do that. So on election night, I said, okay, California law says I have a right to observe the counting of the vote. So I actually went into that room and got dragged back out by the belt by two deputies and cuffed and stuffed and put in the back of a cop car. And he drove real fast, too. I wouldn't say he gave me a, the total thrill ride that I've heard about, but he made it a bit rough, got me to the to the um, county jail. I spent 18 hours in there. I remember one discussion with some Mexican gangbanger who goes, these dudes wanted to be in here. <laughs> so uh, at that time, remember I told you I made some money off of Debo? Well, I still had that money. So I was able to pay bail without paying a bail bondsman. And because they tried to get me on felony election tampering or something like that. What the heck? For walking well, in, yeah. A week later, somebody from the county attorney's office looked at California law and said, Oh God, we're sideways. So they dropped all charges and I got my 15 grand bail back. And boy, I didn't lose a dime on the deal. I lost 18 hours of my life. Okay, whatever. Uh, if you haven't seen me, I'm just seeing you're sitting down, but I'm fairly big. I'm like 6'4, 300 pounds. So the risk of something happening to me in the pokey wasn't that bad. And so, nope. But, but I will say, uh, I was de I deliberately left even so much as my pocket knife at home. And when the deputies grabbed me, I said, I'm not resisting, I'm not resisting. You know, so they didn't get me on a, on a resisting arrest charge or anything like that. It was um, a little mini protest right out of the, <coughs> sorry, right out of Dr. King's playbook. But, um, yeah. Okay. Jim, thank you for joining us. Appreciate um, it. A lot of fun. This, sorry this, for the, yeah, the sorry for the hiccups. We're, Going to get this better we, uh, over time, but we're learning. We don't uh, have enough money to run the real pro show here, guys. We, yeah, if you, this is really being handled by a group called California Election Integrity Coalition. We need monies for some simple things like um, 
well, phones and microphones and mm -hmm. things to stabilize the, the, the camera. And if you we have also money, hmm? a lawyers and on site. We would like more than that. We would like lawyers. We ran a great conference in October uh, in Richmond for the whole weekend, and that far exceeded, I think, everybody's expectations. And we want to do another one. Mm -hmm. If you can, please go to GoFundMe.com slash take back the vote and make a donation so that take we can keep take back the vote gofundme.com take slash take back the vote uh, so we can continue these works we are doing these interviews weekly as sort of an extension of the idea of a conference it's a virtual conference over space and time Okay. We are in our own space-time universe, in a sense, mm -hmm. but we would appreciate the contributions, and we very much appreciate, Jim, you coming by appreciate and it. talking with us. Happen to be in town, appreciate it. Um, and we will look forward to talking with you again. Yeah. Thank you for coming by. Thank you.